What's up everybody? Want to give a quick review. I got in Eric July's first comic book. It's uh, Isom number one. See here's the cover of it. I got it signed. Um, Eric July, he started a um, comic book universe. It's called the Ripperverse. And this was his first entry. Blew, just blew numbers out of the water as far as the, the sales on it. He started, I, I think the campaign started in the middle of July, somewhere like July 11th. Ended up, bef when the campaign, the the pre-order campaign ended, he had raised over $3.7 million in uh, revenue from sales of the, the book and the merchandise, which is a massive number for comics. Um, to put in perspective, Berserker by Keanu Reeves, when he did a he did a uh, crowdfund for that and that, that raised over a million didn't come close to these numbers and this is a uh, it's a graphic novel it's a meaty meaty book it's 96 pages the and here's the kind of the artwork on the back the best selling graphic novel from last year was around moved around 25,000 units uh, his book moved around 60,000, 58,000 in that neighborhood, I think. So just massive numbers, more than doubled the best-selling graphic novel from last year. So that's, that's a major accomplishment um, right off the bat. I mean, especially your first first comic book, you get in, in, into this market for the first time, start a comic book company, and you come out and kick the doors down, put up 3.7 million and selling that many units. Something like over 44,000 customers in that range, over 40,000 customers bought 58,000 books. And it's still selling. It's still, you know, it's going to uh, comic book stores and they're selling it. It's selling online. The aftermarket for the book, um, for like this cover, cover A, you know, there's people selling this. I got it for $50 autographed for... People who are buying it on the aftermarket, some of those are selling for $150, $200, $300. So just a big aftermarket already for this book, even though it just started shipping out here recently, just over the last couple of weeks. So massive, uh, massively successful. I mean, just undeniably successful for a, for the launch. Um, and it's getting high praise. As customers seem to really like it, you're seeing a lot of people praising the story um and he's he's it's gonna build out he's already he's in the midst of writing isom number two he's got additional teams that are writing series um that will probably be from other characters that are introduced in this book or maybe just new characters from the world but he's got you know other other writers and artists that are joining his universe and joining his company to write stories in this universe. So it's, it's not going to be like a flash in the pan. You know, he's already grinding and putting out more content. So it's something that, you know, likely you're probably going to get multiple books a year at the rate that he's, that he's going, which is good because at 96 pages, I think that's good for something. If you were, doing something like quarterly or, you know, two, three, four a year, that's probably, that's probably pretty solid. If you're doing multiple series and you're putting out more than two, three, four books a year, then that's even, that, that's even better. Um, the, the more you can grow out the universe and, uh, give people multiple different stories, obviously that's preferable in a, in a when you're building a comic, um, universe that's going to be wide ranging and have multiple different characters. So I, I like that. I like what he's doing. I think it's, uh, I think it's got a lot of potential to be a big name in the, the comic sphere. It's already just getting off the ground, putting up those kind of numbers, getting that kind of publicity. Um, that's big. I mean, it's kind of similar to how I like, I look at Brandon Sanderson putting out, uh, his Kickstarter that, you know, pulled in $40 million. That's a game changer that that's, that's allowing him, giving him more leverage when he talks to studios, when he wants to start having some of his books made into movies and TV shows. Uh, it obviously shows him that he's unconstrained. He can put out any kind of story he wants and he knows he's got an audience base 
that is clamoring for it and that's going to put in heavy money. So when Eric, Eric July has something like this where he can drop this kind of money, uh, you know, that kind of money in the first showing shows that he's got a large audience. You know, who knows what is the second book? I'm sure it's not going to do maybe it will do more, but I would be surprised if it did more than 3.7 million um, because it's the first book. You know, typically you would see less, uh, you know, a lower revenue figure for subsequent issues, but it shows how big the audience is. You know, he's got over 40,000 customers and he's a, uh, he's got a growing fan base. He's got over 500,000 YouTube followers, he's got a bunch, you know, probably over a million followers between the different social media platforms. So it's, I really like that when independent creators are able to kind of build their own audience that operates outside the traditional delivery methods, because then they're able to kind of tell whatever story that they want, and they don't have to worry about whether it's going to be approved by some corporation or, or anything like that, where they have to uh, kowtow to people who are who might not even be, you know, invested in storytelling, it might just be you know, what they think is going to make them an extra dollar. And, and he's got the ability now where he could tell tell s bigger stories, smaller stories, stories that, you know, draw in a less, less revenue that still make a, a profit, but it services the, you know, his desires and he's able to kind of tell whatever story he wants, knowing he's got a big enough fan base that he, he's going to be able to make money. He's going to be able to make a profit on his stories without having to, um, you know, bend over backwards and, and trying to attract particular people and trying to pull in from all these different varied areas and trying to just do fan service. So I like that. And then I also like that he kind of establishes what his code of ethics are for his Ripperverse universe. So he's got things like respect the customer, uh, which, you know, goes without saying you should respect the customer. I, I, I It should go without saying. Obviously, you know, you see some of the reactions from, you know, the, the big corporations with the Amazon, with Disney, and, you know, you, you see how many fan bases are being attacked. Um, you've seen it with Star Wars. You see it with Lord of the Rings. You see it with, you know, the Marvel Universe pretty much everything down to now they're, you know, even starting fights with Scooby-Doo audiences it's getting ridiculous. So, I mean, if you're, if you're at the point where you're starting fights with the Scooby-Doo fan base, you've jumped the shark, man. Like you've, you've, you've lost, uh, you lost scope of what, what is important. So obviously restating things like that, it's, it's about getting back to basics, respect your customers. You know, there's no reason to be starting fights with them. Uh, canon and continuity and a comprehensive timeline are also a part of it. So that's things like he doesn't want to have uh, multiverses and time travel. Um, reason being is he doesn't particularly like when stories are able to backtrack on what they previously established. So when you have time travel and you have multi -universe, multiverses, you can erase any decisions that you just previously made. So if you kill off a character, well, you can just time travel and bring them back. So take some of the stakes away from the storytelling when you can erase your decisions or that they're they're not relevant to the main scope of your world. Doesn't mean that you know all multiverse stories are bad or that um, having time travel makes bad stories. Some of those stories are great. Um, some of them are phenomenal. So it's not necessarily that those are a bad thing, but it does lessen the stakes of a universe when you have that crutch. Uh, some, and, and it also introduces the ability to allow for lazy writing, where if, if you want to introduce like a new character, you want to have uh, a black character, you want to have a Muslim character, you want to have an Asian character uh, or a female character, Instead of introducing new characters into those roles, you can just say, okay, well, now we got a, a black Spider-Man and a girl Spider-Man and, uh, and um, you know, a Muslim Spider-Man and a Spider-Man this, Spider-Man that. And you can have 50 million Spider-Mans and there's no limits to anything. It, it that, that allows for a lot of lazy writing where corporations are just checking boxes and 
trying to get the publicity from the press almost where it's just they put this out and like hey look at us clap for us look at how great we are instead of just telling a new story introducing a new character or or building up the established fan base you know the established characters that already have those characteristics that you're looking to push um it allows for you to just kind of piggyback off of a a massive ip with a massive fan base and just kind of sidestep building something new and creating something new and you're just piggybacking off of something that's already established so that can lead to lazy writing. i mean you it doesn't mean that every uh character again you could have a great story with a uh, miles morales or something like that where you're you're basically just taking you know peter parker and now he's miles morales it's it's almost the same story i mean there's some differences but it's more or less it's the same kind of story and that doesn't you know and the, and the miles morales uh stories can be very good and very popular if you can hear that rumble in the background it's because you know florida is crazy and we get crazy thunderstorms but it does allow lazy writing and so i like when i like the fact that he's boxing himself in to where he's not going to do that um you know as long as he sticks to what he says which i you know i have no reason to doubt him um that that'll force him to dig deep and if he wants to build out a new character or introduce new characters it's going to take talent to do it uh, there's not going to be any piggybacking off of previous characters and if he does that it's obviously he's going to get called out on it by his his fans and so he, he's put himself in a position where the only way for him to succeed is talent it's got to be good stories. It's got to be good characters. It's got to be well written. He's not going to be able to survive long term, um, just trying to uh, trying to piggyback off of previous things that he's done or previous things other universes are done. Or or if he makes a decision that the fans don't like, he's not going to be able to just erase it with the next you know the next story. And so. It uh, makes it more challenging, and uh, but I think it has bigger stakes. It's similar to the way uh, George R. R. Martin writes, where you know it, the, con- the because there are consequences when you're reading the story, and you see a character that you like gets put in a dangerous position. You don't know if he's going to make it out of it. Whereas, in you know, and that's not to say like uh, George R. R. Martin, he'll criticize uh, Lord of the Rings, which he, he likes the story, but. He says he thinks it would have been a better decision to kill off Gandalf. And that kind of shows his mentality and the way he writes is he wants higher stakes. He wants you to feel the danger and the threat. But that's not what Tolkien's doing. He's telling a different kind of story. And, and Tolkien's a master, obviously. He's, a, he's, you know, and Martin would put him at the tippy top of fantasy writers. So, you know, it's not, a, it's not to denigrate that other style. But it does, it brings in an interesting element, which I like. So I'm glad that he's doing that. And um, I think it, it uh, has the potential to pay off in a significant way. I think it could build a, a significant audience that um, is really attracted to that style of comic book universe. But to give you an idea on the story, because the, the artwork is good. Um, I like it. It's obviously... You got Cliff Richards and Gabe El Taib. Uh, they are both pros in the industry. They've worked with DC, Marvel. They've worked with big names, and they, you know, they're pros. And so, and you can tell it's clear that these are talented artists and, and colorists. And um, you know, and, and the panels all look good. The writing's cool. Like everything flows together. It's easy to follow. There's nothing about it that um, contradicts what he's established already. So just it's the internal logic is consistent, which is important for a story um, that can really derail things if there's not if it's not internally consistent. And uh, when you're this is first foray into writing a book. So uh, that's important that he establishes that, you know, that's going to be the case moving forward. You, you don't want to see like uh, someone throws out their first offering and then um you know, a bunch of it is internally inconsistent, but you know, like here, I don't want to give like spoilers away on the story. So, but you can kind of see like some of the artwork here, that's Isom, the main character, that's his niece. So you could see kind of the, the, uh, artwork 
that is there. There's another one that's, I think it's like a real good panel to kind of demonstrate um, some of the artwork. I'll try to pull it up here. So like on, on uh, this one, you can see the lighting. He's in the club. You can see all the, the people around. I mean, that's, you know, whether that's your style of, of art, you like that or not, it's clear that the, the talent is there. So if, if you like, when you look at some of the different panels, if you like that artwork, it's consistent throughout. It's good. Um, so you, if you like what you see from the panels that they show, you're going to like the, the book's artwork. Um, storytelling, it, um, it's, a, it's a story that is it's, uh, street level is the way I would describe it. It's similar in the vein of like a daredevil or a Batman where it's kind of a street level story. It's not ha the the stakes, at least in this self contained story, the stakes are not uh, universe impacting or worldly impacting, at least from what we can see on the surface. You know, obviously the story can expand and, and there could be things going on behind the scenes that are bigger than are initially told. But it's a pretty self contained street level story without just massive, you know, end of the world stakes. It's um it's more in the vein of a, like a, a story you would see on on Daredevil that you see on Netflix, and it would be like as far as you know the first issue. It, it feels like the the first episode in like maybe a ten twelve story arc. I mean, who, I don't know how long the the arc would be, but I could easily see where this would be like the first episode in a ten episode season or twelve episode season on a TV show. And it's uh, it's a good story. It's uh, it's not it's not complex. Um, it's, it's pretty. Um, it, it's pretty. I don't know. Like I, I, it's it's just not a. It's not convoluted. It's easy to follow. It's something that I think you know. If you're a 15 year old kid, you'll be able to follow along. You won't have any any troubles. It's not going to be. Um, uh, it's not going to have anything that's above your age range where that you shouldn't be reading it either because of, uh, your developmental stage or because of uh, it's inappropriate material. I think it's appropriate for someone who's like 15, 14, 13, something, you know, in that range. And I think it would be, uh, appropriate for any age above that. Um, you know, I'm 42 and it's, you know, perfectly appropriate story for me. I mean, it's it's a story that I liked. I, I thought it was a good story, and and I'm interested to see where it goes. Uh, one of the best parts that I like about the way he did it is obviously he's establishing a universe. So you have parts where there's other prominent characters that are not prominent in this story, but are clearly prominent within the scope of the universe, and so. The way it kind of establishes them is they kind of uh, sometimes a little, they barge into his story or they're kind of in the background of his story, why things are going on. Uh, like I, I give you an example. There's a situation where there's a couple characters talking to each other in a bar that Isom later comes to that, that bar, that club. And so they have their little conversation that's kind of going on in the background, but they're not part of the overall scope of Isom's story. It's just they're shown, they're at the club, there are people there, they're having a conversation. It's obviously uh, establishing that they have their own storyline going going on while his storyline's going on. Uh, we're not obviously getting what's going on, why, you know, what the big scope what of their story is. It's Isom's story. But the, he introduces that there are other prominent characters that are having living their own life, and sometimes they barge into his story which I like the way he did that. It's similar to the way uh, Brandon Sanderson does the, the Cosmere, where you're reading the Cosmere and then you have other characters that are from, you know, different worlds, and the way Brandon Sanderson does it. They're from different worlds, different um, uh, way away from the story that they're currently in. They have their own, like, um, give me an example, uh, like Brandon Sanderson, he's got w characters from Warbreaker, that are that are barged into characters in Stormlight, and they kind of interact with each other. But you're not getting like in Stormlight, you're not getting the fully fleshed out what happened to these characters in Warbreaker. They're just in 
Stormlight. And then if you go read Warbreaker, then you find out what's going on in their storyline. So he's got he's setting it up where you'll be able to he'll be able to do things along that that nature. Where like a character like uh, Yaira, who's one of the prom uh, a prominent character that kind of just barges into his story briefly, but where he could start a series with her, and you could find out what was going on preceding that, and then after that from where she barged into his, where in her story from her series, it would be more like he's barging into her storyline. So I like the way he did that. I think it's it, the, the, one of the reasons I like it is because it shows that he's planning things out. He has a, he has a plan. He's, he's not just thinking, I'm just going to tell this self-contained story and then I'm going to move on and tell another self-contained story. He's building a universe and he's making it interconnected which is, uh, takes planning, it's difficult, and it takes a lot to pull off. So we'll see, you know, how he, how he does when he starts introducing other series and how those characters kind of play off of this story and how, how the different characters interact with each other when they're in, um, you know, when Isom in, shows up in someone else's story or when Yara shows up in some Isom story, those kind of things. We'll see how those things play out together and how they interconnect and whether they flow consistently, the characters remain consistent and the different uh, series. So we'll see how well he pulls it off, but I love that that's the, the starting point and the kind of how he's establishing these other characters. So that, that's going to be interesting to see. And it, uh, it, it intrigues me to get more into the entire universe rather than just isolated on Isom. Um, critiques. Uh, I don't have a, a, a lot. It's, uh, I think he, he's, it's, it's, I, you know, it's his first, first story. So I would say the writing is good. The dialogue is good. Uh, the storytelling is good. He's obviously talented. Um, you can see that, but I think that as he gets more stories under his belt, it's, it's kind of similar to my thoughts when I read uh, Elantris, where you can see all the talent from Brandon Sanderson, but you're like, this isn't his, his best work yet. The best is clearly yet to come. He's, he's going to keep, keep growing as a writer and just get better and better, tighten things up. So um, the talent is evident. It's all good. But I think the potential for him to become a, a really good, phenomenal writer is is there. And I think that's you know, and I think because of his passion, that this is a passion project for him, I think you're likely going to see that, that he's just going to keep getting better and better. So, like, one of the critiques I would have is that, similar to most new writers, when they're doing info dumps, um, the, it's it's clunky at times. So, in the dialogue, there it it's it's not it doesn't flow kind of naturally. the The dialogue doesn't feel like uh, a natural conversation, which is almost every new writer I ever come across, even a lot of pros. I mean, info dumps are one of the hardest things to pull off naturally. There's almost, there's almost no one who's really, really good at it. Um, it's just, I, I think, and, and it's, I'm not even saying like his are like pull you out of the story. Like, Oh, what is this? This is bad. It's not, it's not bad. It's, it's fine. It's just, it could be better. It could be tightened up and it could have, uh, been phrased differently and in a way that feels like a more natural conversation. Just some some of the times where it's like, you know, it feels a little weird why why, why this character would just be dumping this info. And I, I think there could have been, you just change the phrasing a little bit, tighten up a little things, I think it would have flowed a little bit better and, and um, came off better. So it's just kind of a, you know, more of a, a nitpick areas for growth. I don't, like I said, I don't think it was done poorly it just that that's probably the dialogue and the world building um that is introduced through the dialogue that's probably the area where he's got the the most room for growth the storytelling and the planning and the the setup for other series the setup for where this story is to come i think those are where he's uh, already um strong at and and we'll just keep getting better at those kind of things so i think the potential is that he could become just a beast um as a comic book writer i i think that's where the potential is when i read the book 
and for especially when you're thinking it's a first book and you're like this does not feel like this is his first book i mean and and that's which when you read talented writers that's what you see it's like okay this is his first book there's areas for there's room for growth but the fact that this is the starting point and this is his first book and it's already at this level that's hugely encouraging for people who want to be invested in this world so I would recommend it. If you like comic books, you like superhero stories, you like street level stories, I think it's a book that I would um, I would take a look into. Uh, he's still selling uh, the, there's three covers. There's A, B, and C. I got A and B autographed and then I got C coming. And I still haven't got B yet, otherwise I would show it. So when I do my longer review, I'll do that once I have everything in and I'll show you everything. But, um, the cover C's are still available. So if it's something that you want to check out, you can go to ripperverse.com and you can buy it there. And so that, um, that I think I'm pretty sure that he's just going to always have that available that, you know, as he sells out, I don't think there's going to be any limits, whereas there's limits on a and B. He's not going to be, you know, putting out more of those. Like if he's, selling any it's just kind of on supplies that he has in his warehouse already i don't think he's going to be printing more books uh which would be stupid just because you want to have collectibles and things that are blown up on the uh secondary market like he's got so i don't, I don't imagine that will the there'll be any more of those uh um, coming out and then he's also got these cards that i'm looking forward to getting that tell some of the more the i think you know I, I don't know a lot on them but i i my Presumption is that it's going to tell more on some of the other characters, more on Isom and Yara and some of these er other characters that are introduced and give you a little bit more world building information through these the really cool looking cards. So I'm looking forward to getting those. I'll show you those when I get them and I'll talk about more of the kind of the universe that he's building. Um, I'll go more into in depth in the story. I don't want to get into it a lot right now because there's so many people who haven't got it yet. And so I'll, I'll save for more of a spoiler discussion once I get everything in, because that's probably going to be about the time that who, people who are going to get it will have got it by then. And, and if you hadn't, you can just, you know, watch the video at a later time. So I'll dig in more there later. But uh, yeah, I would recommend it. It's good. It's a good book. I think I'm really looking forward to see what this guy's going to bring to the table. Um, I like what he's doing. I love the the passion in it. It's obviously he's a huge comic fan and I love um, good street level superhero stories. Uh, I love uh, I love, uh, you know, a lot of the the comic stories and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what he does with this world. I think Isom's uh, a cool, interesting character. Uh, we learn a little bit about him, get a little bit of his personality, but it's clearly building to something more. And there's there's backstory things that we'll learn about his backstory as we go along. Clearly, and so I'm looking forward to learn more about his character. But yeah, if um, if you want to check it out, go to ripperverse.com. Eric July, Isom number one. It's about halfway through Isom number two. Got two other teams working on two other series, probably from different characters. Maybe some of them or all of them or both of them from uh, characters that are introduced in this story. So I'm looking forward to seeing who those uh, artists are, who the writers are. Uh, but yeah, I look forward to talking more about what he's doing. Um, I love the, when I see like these inter independent creators blowing up outside the traditional markets, because I think that, uh, keeps the traditional markets, uh, in line and, and forces them to bring their A game. They can't just do, do some of the stuff that they're doing a lot of right now. Um, it'll force them to either bring their A game or get replaced. And so I like what he's doing, what he's shown as far as the potential for the independent comic market. Um, looking forward to it. So those are my thoughts. Uh, let me know what you think. And uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to, you know, shoot me a message. Peace out, folks.